Let me begin by mentioning the book Sobolev Spaces on Metric Measure Spaces, an approach based on upper gradients. This is written by some of the founders of the whole theory, Heinonen, Koskela, Shan Mugulingam, and Tyson. Many things that we do cover here are covered in this book. And uh, one great thing about this book is that it's written so thoroughly and with so much detail that it can be read by graduate students. They have taken the time and patience to really um, bring proof of every lemma and every claim uh, down to the um, very trivial details. So um, that must be a, a reference to have in mind for many things. So, so far we introduced the notion of upper gradients and use that to define Newtonian symbol functions on a metric measure space. Now, when anyone develops a, a set, an abstract theory in very general settings, the first question is, what do we get if we apply that to very concrete examples? For example, if we take our familiar Rn, or let's say more generally an open subset of Rn, and our distance becomes the Euclidean distance of Rn, and our measure becomes the Lebesgue measure restricted to that set, what functions do we get as the N1P of this omega distance and ln. Do we get anything familiar? And the answer, which can be found in the book that I just referenced, is that indeed W1P of omega, which is the classical sobel of spaces defined through weak derivatives, defined through integration by parts, ends up being equal to the N1P omega space. We're talking about P between 1 and infinity. And that's great because this is uh, quite impressive since the definition of W1P is very Euclidean. We talk about partial derivatives, directions, and uh, many results there follow from applying Fubini type theorems, which again depend on foliation of the Euclidean spaces. Uh, while the definition of N1P um, does not use anything particular to Euclidean spaces, anything that is unique to Rn. That is why we can define it on any metric measure space. And now that we know the claim from this theorem that they are equal then becomes quite impressive. Uh, some results that you can, you, you know for M1P spaces in general, then apply to here and then some, some results that you have here, then you can try to generalize to the more a general setting of metric measure spaces or uh, certain metric measure spaces like Heisenberg group and stuff like that. So um, this starting theorem um, of our examples that we will have of what N1P looks like in various settings uh, is, is, is a great starting point because it shows the efficacy and usefulness of the space N1P. Um, we have to talk about this equality, which I now put in quotation marks, because it has to be understood in a precise sense. Uh, let's recall our examples. We have had two examples that we discussed in detail. And that is, if you start with zero function on Rn, so take just x to be all of Rn, in this case, say R2, 
and uh, with the usual distance and metric if you change the zero function so u everywhere is zero obviously belongs to w1p and also it belongs to n1p then we saw that at least for certain p values if you define u a new one u1 to be one at x equals zero the origin and zero everywhere else this function so u1 still belongs to again for maybe certain only exponents of p uh, belongs to w1p and to n1p we went through actually a lot of uh, computation to verify that just that one exceptional point uh, was posing us some challenge in finding the right upper gradient um, one other fact about this was that the u1 here um, has n one p norm equal to zero so in the in the class of equivalence class of functions u1 is equivalent to the zero function then we adjusted our example and we saw that we don't have as much leisure when we remove a line segment so if ux u2 of x is defined to be so let me use two variables xy equals one if y is between zero and one and x is equal to one just one line segment and zero elsewhere now this u2 function still belongs to w1p this is because w wp functions uh, remain in the same equivalence class if you change the values on a set of measure zero so uh, because u2 is equal to zero lebesgue almost everywhere and this means as, as a sobolev function it's no different than the zero function however u2 did not belong to n1p so as a point as, as a everywhere defined function which is the convention we're using uh, throughout um, this function is not in n1p so when in the theorem we said that w1p equals to n1p what happens to example u2 and that is where the interpretation of that equality should be understood so that equality is in the following sense so w 1 p of omega equals to n 1 p of omega means if you give me if given a function u in w 1 p again everywhere defined of omega we can find we can adjust it we can change it on a set of measure zero so that the new function which we distinguish because our functions we don't identify um, is now in n1p of omega so that's how one function w1p gives a function in n1p but also because we want to say um, this is as, as a Banach space these are equal that means uh, when you take a norm the the norms are also equal 
So it's an actually an, an isometry of Banach spaces. But even before we take a norm, we have to make sure that um, if you change the representative of this function u, so say you, you change u to u tilde um, by changing the values on a set of measures 0, then this is still equal to u. So as a member of the Banach space, they are the same elements. As functions to us, they are not, but if you want to treat them as elements in W1P, they are the same. So if we run this assignment of a corresponding function in 1P, do the end results end up in the same equivalence class of N1P? In other words, and the answer to that is yes, so if u tilde is equal to u almost everywhere and we choose okay and then we choose we change u tilde on a set of measure zero then it ends up in an 1p so then um, the corresponding through this, so the corresponding function to u tilde is equivalent in N1P omega to um, that of u. This is what I'm saying here is basically saying that it's well defined. The assignment is well defined. The assignment is, is uh, it works at the level of equivalences. So here is the space W1P. Here's the space N1P. Okay, I pick something here and I assign a quantity here. I'm saying that if you choose another representative of this because elements in W1P are equivalent classes. I'm saying that if I choose another representative, then I end up with something different, but now they belong to the same class in N1P. So that makes this assignment, call it an injective map, an embedding, whatever you call it, that becomes well-defined as a map between Banach spaces. And actually their norms, so part of the theorem is that their norms then are equal. So you W1P becomes equal to this assigned U in 1P. So after we change, we cannot even write like U here. As I mentioned, you have to change it on a set of measure zero to be in N1P in the first place. So this is kind of that injective map into N1P. Uh, so Again, the reason is here. So if you start with this U2, it belongs to W1P. But if you don't change it on a set of measure 0, it won't belong to N1P. So after changing on a set of measure 0, which here you will just ignore that line segment and correct the values back to 0, it will end up in N1P. And uh, so starting with W1P, we gave, we said that there is a function that ends up in N1P. The reverse is actually easier. So if given U in N1P, you don't even have to change it on a set of major zero or anything. Um, U already is in W1P. And if the well-definedness at the level of Banach space, and if u tilde is equivalent with respect to N1P equivalence to u, then u tilde as a function in W1P is equivalent to, to u. Um, this is because, because if you change the representative of an N1P function, then u tilde equals to u almost everywhere. 
and later we will see that it's actually more than almost ever actually u tilde okay the set where u tilde of x is not equal to u of x um, is even smaller than being measure zero its capacity is so smaller than uh, just being null set sense of the big measure um, the phenomenon the reason that going from w1p to n1p required the change of function on some set but going backward did not uh, is due to this general phenomenon that functions in n1p are better point-wise represented than those in W1P. W1P is just too generous with letting the functions change on sets of measure zero. N1P is not. Again, I know I'm repeating this example a million times, but it's so central. This function, even if you had it the whole infinite line, um, would it still be in W1P, right? As long as you have u equals 0 everywhere else, and here u equals 1, no, no matter on how big a line or part of a line, you change the value of the constant function to 1, you are still in W1P. That's just by definition of weak derivatives and classical sobel of things. But for this same function to be in N1P, you can still artificially change the, its values on some sets, but they cannot contain a line segment. In fact, their dimension, Hausdorff dimension, cannot even be equal to 1. So, um, starting with u equal to 0, which is in N1P, obviously, and also in W1P, you can change it on any set of measure 0 and still be in W1P and be the same function from that point of view but um, to remain an N1P function you can change it only up to um, say host you can change it only on sets with Hausdorff dimension no more than here we're talking about R2, so it will be 2 minus P. So, for example, if you're talking about uh, P1 and half, then N1P can be altered only on sets with dimension less than or equal to 0.5 which is much less than much smaller sets than Lebesgue measure zero because you can have dimension one counter sets with measure zero they are still much larger than this 
Okay, so we went into subtleties of what this equality means, which is necessary to really understand. But the takeaway message, again, is that the abstract theory we have produced does give back something concrete and meaningful. So next video, we will continue with other examples and in other contexts of what N1P looks like.